<laughs> well, today they're they're pushing through the Heroes Act. If you all don't know that, we want that to go through, especially those of us who are taking care of buildings. Yes. <laughs> because in that fine print of that bill, there's an act in there where you cannot be sued if someone contracts COVID in your building. A lot of people don't know that, but we want that to pass today. <laughs> I think my daughter said they have, I think she said four, four people in their congregation with it. Oh, geez. And they had a, in the community, they had a woman, a parent that had two kids, both tested positive and she sent them to school. Oh, uh, see now, how do you protect a building from that? Yeah. You, you, you know, you try to do everything you can and then someone willingly knows what's going on and just drops the ball. That's a shame. Well, yeah, and you know, we're at the mercy of each other, you know. Yeah. We have to either work with each other or not. Or die with each other. Or die with yeah. each other. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, geez. Hey. Bob, did you um, did you post the uh, session from last week? Uh, yeah, the link was okay. in the, the announcement email. Okay. I saw there were a bunch of links there and I have it sitting there on my desktop, but I didn't, I didn't take time to look carefully. Yeah. I've hey, been Bob. trying to give you a lot of links these days. <laughs> That's Bob, a good... it's pro... Bob, it's probably easier to preach the gospel than it is to try to understand copyright regulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you Bob, for sending that out. I, I appreciate it. I'm an old guy and it's, um, it's a little difficult for me to understand all that stuff, but thank you for putting that out. Sure, you're welcome. I hope it didn't confuse things more. Um, <laughs> that I am, doesn't do much, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. Uh, I have reached out to both Augsburg Fortress and Lynn License to ask if somebody would join us to ask questions. Um, so hopefully they will be able to do that in the next couple weeks. Our musician and administrator ventured out on those questions alone. I will ask her, Bob, to um, email you because oh. they have had to radically change how everything is printed and posted. Okay, yeah, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Brown. I'm with Advent Lutheran Church, and I'm just sitting <coughs> in and listening to what's happening. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Good to see you. Well, good morning. Let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this opportunity to be community together, even though we are in our little boxes and our own spaces. Um, we are together. We are community via the internet. And you are always present with us in this time, in this place. Bless our conversations and bless the deliberations of our churches as we worship, open buildings, do outdoor things in this new time. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bob, I'm glad you weren't wearing a mask because I understand it's hard for God to hear our prayers when you would have a mask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you hear that? <laughs> uh, Baker, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Saying God is a little hard of hearing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh. Uh, <laughs> well, um, good morning, and uh, Denny, thanks for, for joining us. Sure. Um, we had uh, gotten a um, shout out about you from, I forget, one of the folks in, in, uh, from your church who was in the call um, a couple of weeks ago. And so we thought, since there are a ton of questions about buildings and 
as we, you've already shown us, you're on top of this stuff. Um, we thought um, we would ask, maybe, maybe it would be good if you want to start, um, just share a little bit about the kinds of things you've had to consider um, as you're looking at getting people back in the building. And I know you're not back in for worship, right? Nope, we are not. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Dennis Smith. I've been at Trinity for 21 years. I came from Trinity. I used to be uh, at a meat packing plant. So I worked in the USDA for 20 years of my life and I was in ammonia refrigeration. Hmm. And then I did, uh, I was a service tech for a farm and home oil company, so I did AC there too. So what I'm going to start off with is what a lot of people seem to be concerned about is the airflow through the building. So that's one of the major things we had to deal with here at Trinity. So back in 97, Trinity did a major building expansion. And so in that expansion, the new part the new building got new units with which they also had the capability of bringing outside air. Now the sanctuary, when they upgraded that, they did not have the capability of bringing in fresh outside air. So not only does this become a concern for all the issues we're dealing with now, but it also raises the CO2 when you put a lot of people in this small, in one place. So there was a lot of issues to deal with and we've dealt with them over time. So the, the basic thing is, does everyone understand exactly how an air conditioner really works? <laughs> okay, so we'll just try and go through it quick. So there's, there's like two basic types. There's a split system and there's a package system. So on our site, we actually have 22 systems here. So we have five that are very large package systems. A package system has the evaporator coil, which is inside, the condenser coil, which is outside, and that's all contained in one package. And so like on our rooftop for our Heisen Hall, our big uh, gymnasium, uh, we use that quite often. That has a 40 ton package unit on it. So everything is self-contained. Now on a split system, your condenser is located outside. There's piping up to your attic and usually your interior evaporator coil is inside. A lot of times with the split system, you have no outside air capability unless they actually installed a ductwork bringing in fresh air. That's what we recently did here at Trinity to help bring more fresh air into the sanctuary. Now, obviously I'm talking about a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So what can you do to, to help your your quality of air inside your church without spending a lot of money, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. So what happens when your, your return air comes from your, your space? It goes through one set of ductwork into the unit, passes through a filter. After it goes through the filter, it goes through the coil. Any humidity which is what we're doing when we're remove, trying to cool the air, we're removing the humidity, gets trapped on the coil and then becomes liquid. That's condensation. That then drips down and you'll see a lot, like if you have a, a unit at home, you'll see where your line sets go up the wall, you'll see a piece of PVC coming down that drips water sometime. That's the condensation coming off the coil. So what typically happens is after your space comes down the temperature you want, the condenser coil shuts off, which stops the compressor. The fan continues to run to dry that coil off. If we don't dry that coil, we're gonna get mold. 
and then the, it just continues and that's the way it works. Package system works the same way, except for it's all one unit. And a lot of package systems have what's called an economizer. That's a vent. So let's say it's 55 degrees outside. Your space, because you just put 100 people in there, is 75 degrees and you have the temperature set at 72. That package unit's gonna turn on, the fan's gonna run, but the compressor won't run. It's gonna open that damper and bring the 55 degree fresh air in from outside to use as cooling instead of running the compressor. That's gonna save you money. That's why it's called an economizer. In a lot of cases, you may have that and it's not being used on a regular basis to bring fresh air in. So your AC technician can come in and make it so that every time that unit runs, that damper can be open at 15% to constantly bring fresh air in the building at the same time. Now, not only is that gonna, that's gonna help you with fresh air, but everything we're gonna talk about costs money, unfortunately. So let's say it's 90 degrees outside and your, your unit comes on, that 15% damper is going to open, even if it's 90 degrees, you're going to be cooling that 90 degree air. So that's going to cost you more money. But in this situation, what you want to do is make sure you're bringing in enough fresh air to support the people you have in the building. Now, the CDC wants you to bring in 15% in a closed area, especially an office area. It used to be 10% years ago. Now it's 15%. So now that we have an idea, does everybody have an idea on the, the flow of the air? Everybody's good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then after the flow of the air, what do we do about the contaminants in the air? So the one way the CDC wants you to do that filter that's in your air conditioner, there's different variations. A lot of you probably don't even know. Your AC guy just changes filter and doesn't even tell you what he put in there. So what the CDC is recommending is a MERV. A MERV is a minimum efficiency reporting value. The MERV for a filter is one from 20. The CDC is recommending a 13 MERV. Now, is it as simple as throwing that in your, your air conditioner and now I'm fine? Unfortunately, no. As the MERV number goes higher, the filter is tighter. And as you tighten the filter, you're restricting airflow across the coil. As you restrict airflow across the coil, you're reducing the efficiency of your unit. It's gonna take you longer to bring the space down to temperature. So instead of just going ahead and changing your filters, you need to make sure that your technician, you have to have a conversation with them and say, can, I, can my unit support this? A lot of things have to go into consideration when you change the filter <clears throat> in a unit. You have to make sure your CFM, it's your uh, yeah, cubic feet per minute of airflow across the coil does not decrease to a point where your coil will freeze up. And by putting a, a heavy MERV filter in there, restricts the flow, in turn will make your coil freeze up. So he can simply put a probe inside your return duct and check your airflow, your CFM, to see if you have enough airflow across the coil to support a 13 MERV filter. And the CDC is claiming that that will remove COVID. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have that system, you have a system, you had your AC guy came in and said, no, you know, there's nothing I can do. I can't put that tight of a filter mm -hmm. in your system. It's not all done there. The other thing you can do is on the other side of the refrigeration coil, a lot of people are doing now, 
is they're installing UV lighting. The UV lighting will kill most contaminants. And that stays on all the time. The, the one thing that is really good about it, it also cleans the coil. Huh. So it, it restricts the, the growth of mold and other pathogens that we worry about in an AC system. Now, a lot of your techs will probably come in and say, oh yeah, well, you wanna put one at your coil, you wanna put one 10 feet down your duct, 20 feet down your duct, and they're gonna, they're gonna have you putting in 50 UV lights. I don't think that's necessary, and most of the techs I deal with, they say the most important part is right at the coil. So an average cost for a UV light is anywhere from 150 to 500 dollars, depending on what type you purchase. Uh, one of the most common that I've dealt with before is the R2000. It's made by Reco, R-E-K-O, and uh, that's a good light. Most of the companies I deal with use that right at the coil, and it kills. You know, it helps your filter system. So it, it, that's the direction I'm gonna try and go here with some of our units, excuse me, particularly in our office area where people are here, will be here hopefully soon all day long again. So is there any questions so far? I mean, I, I tend to, I've been doing this for 40 years, so I tend to just and people get lost. Denny, I got a question for you on the airflow uh, because I can't speak all your lingo. Um, do I just tell them to uh, adjust the economizer to 15% fresh air? You simply ask them first if you have an economizer that can, yep. that, can, that can enable you to, as soon as the unit comes on, bring in 15% fresh air. So there's a lot of things that, that you need to think about. Um, you also need to think about the capacity of your building. So Trinity, we can, we can put 800 to 1,000 in here. If we reopen, we're thinking 200 people maximum. Mm -hmm. Maximum, if we do the separation. And so we based that when we checked out the two units that we picked on to put these ducts in we checked the airflow there to make sure that we could bring in enough fresh air to support 200 people in the sanctuary. Okay. So when I say have a talk with your, your AC guy, I'd sit down with them and, and bring all this up. So one of the things I want to make sure you know is a lot of this that I'm talking about, you can get online from Granger. Granger is a supply house a lot of us use. Uh, I know probably some of you know what I'm talking about. So Granger Industrial Supply, if you go on their website, they actually have a link you can click on that says reopen my building. And then if you scroll down, there's all different areas. And one of them is HVAC strategy, strategies blah, 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 to control airborne pathogens. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so you can print that out. Okay. And as you read it, highlight everything <clears throat> you want to ask your technician and bring it with you when you talk to them. Everything I'm talking about is in here. And so. Hey, hey Denny, here's a question for you. Um, I'm, well, I have, we have a home in Florida and a home here in Pennsylvania. So I, I've seen two different systems. We have ultraviolet light in our Florida location. We understand how that works. And I understand, I just went up here and checked the most recent filter that I have, and it's a MERV 13. Yeah. But, but the controllers and the way the systems are designed today are much more <clears throat> electronic, much more monitoring of the system automatically. And since you're dealing with a variety of churches with different years of construction and right. layouts, not everybody is going to have the same thing. Right. So, is it is it reasonable to assume that you should override the automatic things to accomplish the things that you're suggesting? That's what I'm saying. So an older building that may have an economizer on the package unit may not be smart enough to know when to open and close that. So your AC guy can manipulate that to open when 
as soon as it starts up and it will be open the entire time. Wow. That's what I was trying to explain before. Mm -hmm. So you can do that without putting all kinds of fancy controls on. Um, like 75% of the units here at Trinity are on a smart system. I can go on in my office and I can see every unit and what it's doing. So <laughs> That's, that's something that a lot of people don't have. And that's what I didn't have in the sanctuary with these two units. We had no capability of bringing in fresh air. So what we did is we actually cut a 12 inch hole in the return duct right before it goes into the filter. And we ran 12 inch stacking out through the roof and we put an automatic damper on there. So as soon as that <clears throat> comes on, that automatic damper opens up. It's sort of what, what you're talking about, same thing. You can manipulate it to do what you want it to do without putting fancy controls on it. Under the current COVID restrictions, how long should a filter last? Yeah, that's a tough question. So here's the thing that I've always done here and I learned this a long time ago when I first started in air conditioning. The way you take care of a building all ties together. And one of those that really shows you is the, the filters in your AC system. So a lot of times when we have Christmas services, my staff will be out there in between services and they'll be vacuuming and vacuuming and vacuuming. The people will come up and say, oh, you don't need to vacuum. It don't look bad. Well, that's not why we vacuum. All those little particles that are in that carpet, when you walk in or what you bring in from outside, was people walk in and out, that's getting <clears> them. <throat> that's yeah. going in the return duct and that's going into that filter. So it's more like how do you take care of your building is more important as to when you're gonna change your filters. Typically, we do it two times a year. We do it before the air conditioner starts up and we do it before the heating season starts up. With COVID, you know, if I change my filters, just the cost of filters with 22 units is, is $800. <clears throat> so that's $1,600 a year just in filters for two changes. That's not including my time. You know, like what package unit I was talking about, the 40 ton that's on the roof here, that one unit takes 24 filters. Yeah. So, Can I ask so, a question? Go ahead. I'm in a very different situation. Our building is one of those wonderful historic buildings built before 1900 with no windows that open in the sanctuary and no central air. Right. So you have and no central air at all. We keep doing research in circles, trying to find out if there's well, any option. There is an option. There is an option. Now, it's not the best thing, but that's what I was headed down that road. I was getting there. So, so back to the filter thing. So what, what you do is the more you vacuum, the more you keep them particles from flying in the air and clogging up them filters. So whoever's changing your filters, talk to them. Ask them what they look like. Ask to see them. I always look at my filters. Even if I'm not changing them, they leave them out for me and I throw them away. All my filters are marked. I know what unit they came from. And I have a date on there of what day they were installed. So that I know if I find a filter that's really dirty, I got a problem in that area. So that's, that's, it's, it's, it's the building that tells you when to change the filter. Should, should the filters be treated as hazardous waste and should you wear a respirator when you change? I them? do. I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wear a mask and I wear gloves. I always have because, well, I, I was in the meat business. So, I mean, we wore full suits when we did everything because USDA demanded it. I've got a couple of questions here. First off, we're a small church. We don't have an exhaust on the air conditioning. We're the one that's the two-part air conditioning. Um, so it doesn't sound doable for us for the, your primary recommendation. So I'm 
thinking the um, ultraviolet sounds doable. Is that something that the CDC is approved to use? Yes. If, yeah. Okay, yes. so that's CDC approved. This paperwork that I told you is all, it's all in here. That'll all talk about the UV lighting also. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. And then my next question is, this is all about air conditioning. Does this also work when we switch over to heat? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Again, I'm going to tie you in with the other question about uh, the air conditioner system that has no fresh air. Uh -huh. So we'll move down that line now. So we're done with the filters. Now we'll go on to removing the air from your, your building. So a lot of the older buildings, which the situation was here at Trinity, I wish we still had it, but we don't. When they built this building, we have a huge steeple. In the top of that steeple, there's a giant fan that they disconnected. And so when they built this, they were really smart and intelligent, I'm telling you, because one of the best heats to have, especially for this kind of situation, is radiant heat in the floor. So if you have radiant heat in the floor, you're one up on most of us because Trinity used to and they removed it. So radiant heat doesn't affect the airflow. It just, you know, the heat rises through the floor. It's the most comfortable heat. And also what the CDC wants us to do is try and maintain a 40 to 60% humidity in your building. And the reason why they want you to do that is because now they're talking about, you know, how um, you're, your breath hangs in the air and they're not sure how long COVID hangs there. So, so when they first started talking about that, I, I, I used the theory of asbestos because I just got done doing a big asbestos project here. An asbestos fiber will hang in the air from 48 to 72 hours before oh. it travels to the floor. Okay. Now, if you introduce humidity, the humidity latches on to that and makes it fall faster because it makes it heavier. So that's why they're saying humidity is a good thing to have in your building. You know, we're not comfortable with it, but it actually makes us feel warmer. And also it helps those pathogens get carried to the floor so we can pick them up. So getting to the heating thing, this is one of the things why the CDC is so worried about the heating season coming up because a lot of us in our homes have forced air. Exactly. And mm -hmm. forced air dries the air. Our noses hate it. Our yeah. organs hate it. Our organ that we play hates it. <laughs> so when we do this, we're drying everything out and it's making those particles lighter and keeping them suspended in the air. So one way we can, we can combat that without spending tons of money is do you have an exhaust fan in your building? So the two people who asked me those questions that don't have fresh air coming in, do you have an exhaust fan? No. Up in my third floor attic here, I have a 36 inch exhaust fan. It's huge. I can turn that on and physically draw a negative in the entire building, which brings fresh air in every crack. So your older building with its cracks and leaks and all that is actually going to help you if you have an exhaust fan somewhere that you can turn on and have running the entire time to bring fresh air in. It's amazing how it works. Uh, the, that 36 inch fan is all the way at the other end of the building here. And if I turned it on now and held up a ribbon, you'd see the ribbon go like this. <laughs> it's amazing how it works. And it helped me a lot when I was doing the asbestos project. We used it constantly to bring fresh air across the building. 
And so that's one of the things, that's one of the cheaper ways that you can, you can help yourself to bring fresh air in. So your windows in your sanctuary, you can crack them open a little bit, turn that exhaust fan on and draw a negative, which brings fresh air through your building. But it's going to drive up the heat. Your heat bill is going to go up. So that's why I'm saying everything we talk about today is going to affect we the efficiency. Don't even have windows. You don't have windows. windows. Not windows that open. How about the doors? <laughs> How about uh, doors? We have, a, we have a one door in the back. Well, obviously we don't want to be propping open doors, but if there's some way you can you can use something to screen an area or something, have a have so let's say you cut a damper in somewhere. A, a, an outside damper through your wall. Okay. When you turn that fan on, that damper is open, the, the air will draw through there and out through the fan. So if you have an AC technician, he can, he can come to your building and give you the cheapest way he can install a way to get air flying through your building without spending tons and tons of money. I know that's, I, that's the biggest thing right now. It's, it's, there's so many things you <clears throat> want to do but the costs are just astronomical. You know, you know, one of the problems, Denny, I had a uh, AC tech out back in April and uh, to go over recommendations. And he said, ah, it's, it's all BS. You don't have to do any of this stuff. That's, you know, that's kind of what, what, what we're running up against. Do you have any recommendations for any companies that, uh, you know, might be good resources to call out? Well, it depends on and, and, and Denny, to piggyback that question, should a, should an air conditioner technician have a certain certification that backs mm -hmm. up what he says to you in terms of uh, valid uh, understanding of the processes? Well, the, the, the ones I deal with and I've always dealt with, they always, I make sure they have an engineer on their staff. So a lot of your residential companies don't have that. So you want to look, you actually want to look for a commercial, someone like I have, I have a couple people that I work with and I have for years. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a particularly good position, but um, I have a company that's in Telford that's commercial only, and they do do a lot of work with, with churches. It's Dorn refrigeration. And there's, How do you spell that, Debbie? go ahead. How do you spell it? D O R N. Okay, thank you. And the person I deal with there is Fred Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the neighborhood. That's not funny. <laughs> Welcome to the neighborhood. But anyway, he's very, very knowledgeable. <clears throat> and I've known him from my years at Long Acres. And then there's another guy who's one of my good friends who used to work for IT Landis, who went out on his own. And his name is Ike Jones, and he's very, very smart. But so I have I have people to to contact. So the only thing I can do is tell you that in your area, look for a commercial guy that's been in business. And when you call him up on the phone and you say, "Look, CDC's recommending this 13 MERS filter," you know, can you come talk to me? And if he laughs at you and says what that guy said to you, then hang up because that's just a bunch of malarkey because when he when he made that statement to you it's not just the covid issue it's the co2 in your building mm -hmm. you know a lot of people don't realize that you know a service can go anywhere from 25 people to busting the doors open depending on who the pastor is right so you need to know the capacity of your building and what you can really do to keep people safe we had services here at Christmas time and I was home biting my nails because I know there's going to be 1,200 people here because that's the way it used to be. And the CO2 level in the church, I know, was going to go through the roof. And the older folks who were compromised, you know, we, we, we'd go to a staff meeting on Monday and they'd say so-and-so passed out at the 9 o'clock service. And I'd be like, 
uh oh, how old were they? What kind of conditions do they have? To find out. Well, now I can physically go online and I can look and see what the system <clears throat> level is in our sanctuary because we put that system in so we can see that. So when that tech tells you that, that, that would be, I'm hanging up. I'm finding somebody else. Because so I got, a, I got another question, Denny. If the, the AC is on, does the AC, uh, if, if, if you have droplets, uh, does that dry the droplets and aerosolize that or not? So what they're saying is the droplets sneezing, coughing, three to feet, three to seven feet, and it's on the floor or on a, an object in front of the person. So obviously airflow is going to dry that eventually, but they really don't know how long it takes to kill it. Nobody can really give you an answer. I mean, I've heard people say eight hours. I've heard people say 24 hours, right? So um, what we're looking at is when we do go back in, in between services, we're going to use what we've been using in the preschool, which is this stuff, which I'm going to get to later. And so if you fog, right, your fog will attach to that stuff, your droplets, which you're talking about, which are on objects and on the carpet. And this stuff that I just showed you has a five second kill. So the thing with this though, we've been using this for two years now, two years now. We used to use it before we actually bought a fogger. We were simply using it with the spray bottle. And so um, we didn't just spray it and wipe the table. We spray it this way, up in the air you know, and let it come down. So you're bringing everything in the air down. So anything I'm breathing is coming down, laying on the table. Now the thing with it though, you don't want to leave it sit for too long because it will bleach or make marks on your furniture. So it has a five second kill rate. So if you have people spray down the area and then come back with the micro cloth and wipe down your furniture after you've given it enough time to do its thing, then you should be good. And then also this stuff, when you read it, it's also for soft material. So it'll also kill bacteria on carpets, clothing, blinds, clothing on toys, and on the, the paper blinds that a lot of people have now. And so that's on the label of this. This is called Spray and Go. You can look it up online if you want and read the, the label on all of its properties. And now, if you look on some of the cleaning, the janitorial supplies, you'll see they're selling gallons of stuff that they're guaranteeing is going to kill everything for $70 a gallon. I buy this from a company called Advantage in Philadelphia, and I pay $60 for a case of four. And this lasts me for a long time. But What's that called, Denny? It's called Spray and Go, Air X Spray and Go. Yeah, so Lisa's going to type it in and send it to you. Thank you. All this information that I'm giving you, you can all, anybody can email me anytime and I can give it to you. I can even give you the name of the guy I deal with from Philadelphia. Hey, Denny, the, uh, the companion question again regarding spray would be some people will say, well, the other route would be to get some of these uh, freestanding uh, sanitizer units that either are motorized or, or, or not and some may have UV light in them and so forth. Are they, are they worth it or are they just a, a gamble? It's a gamble, but it's expensive. I quite frankly can't afford to spend the money on them. I, I'm, you, and that's the thing. You have to pick and choose. Where do you think you're going to get the best bang for your buck? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's what we all do in churches. <laughs> we, we save every thing we have and then 
where's the best place? What am I going to get out of this? So a freestanding unit that's constantly doing that, I don't know. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's questionable to me. What about the foggers, Denny? There's all kinds of foggers online to buy. Uh, any, any good and bad you know, advice and all that stuff? Here's what I started with. It's an outdoor fogger from my Ryobi from Home Depot that I paid $150 for. I used it for a year and a half because my preschool, I was having problems with kids bringing in stomach bug and all that. So I got the spray and go and I was simply using the spray and go by spraying it in the air and letting it fall. I mean, if you can't afford to go out and buy all this equipment, certainly there's nothing wrong with this. As long as you spray it in the air, six, seven feet in the air and let it come down onto your tables, your chairs, your floor, and let it do its work and then come back and wipe it up. I mean, it's still covering. You can see how it covers. Once you, the mist falls, you can see all the spots where it lays. So I started with this and I bought this at Home Depot. Now they're like, I know it went through the roof. They were selling them for five, $600 online. Wow. So then to get to um, the, one of the things with the Ryobi is it, it wastes a lot of the material. So your spray is a lot heavier. So I bought one of these which is a victory sprayer, which I also got through Advantage, and it cost $700. They were selling these for $2,000 online. Now the prices are starting to come back down. They're starting to come back down because the problem was everything's from China and China shut everything down, so everything was backed up. Now they're starting to the supply is starting to come back. Sorry about can that. You, can you post up the uh, the number or contact info for Advantage? Yes. So Advantage is in Philadelphia. And Lisa's going to type it and send it. The guy I deal with is Steve DeVito. The owner is Stan Wolf. So Lisa's going to type that in. And you, so mentioned this, you mentioned earlier that that has a problem of uh, staining and or bleaching material. So yeah. are you, are you, since I come from a public health background, it, would that have been a chlorinated based product or, or if not that, is it a quaternary ammonia based product? It's quaternary, yes. Okay. It's a quat, yes. So it's a hospital used material. They use it in all the hospitals. So it, it needs to be on your, your material for a long time to, to cause problems. Like one thing I noticed is I keep my floors really waxed here. And when I would go down the hallway with the Ryobi, if I left it on the floor too long, there was spots on my waxed floors. So with this one, the mist is finer. You can actually adjust the mist on the end of this. If you can see what I'm doing here. If you turn this, you can change the nozzle on how much product it's spraying out so that when you spray, there's differences in the change. Now, once again, when, when I see these people, a lot of them, this is used quite largely in Philadelphia right now. A lot of times, if you're watching the news, you'll see the people using this, but they're spraying it downward toward the table which it really is wasting your product because you want to put it in the air so that it falls. So it's not only cleaning the table and the chairs, but it's, it's bringing everything out of your air and down. So I was showing Lisa earlier, uh, part of the conference table here and we let it come down out of the air and after we wiped it up, this was a clean towel. So it's actually a very clean product. It, it, 
if anything else, go online and look it up and read the label <clears throat> for yourself. So that's that. Anything else? Any questions? And I have an idea what your maintenance budget is, please. <laughs> $187,000 a year. Okay. Wow. Mm. How about the cleaning your air ducts, Denny? Do you got to worry about doing, having them come in before we reopen to clean the air ducts? So a lot of your air ducts, the interior ones, have insulation inside of them. So you have to be careful how you clean them. It's not just like there's metal inside. It has a fiber board inside that's an inch thick. And so that protects the air that's going through from the elements in your attic and stuff. So, I mean, there's no sense of cooling your air and sending it through a duct that's being heated by the attic. So that's why there's insulation in there. When I get my, my uh, units done every year, so every spring we have the startup and they check the duct work. And so far, because I keep the filters regularly changed, I don't have a problem with my duct work, but they inspect it. Yeah. Now, I, I don't think ours has been done since 1890 when they built it. <laughs> and that's the case with most churches. Uh, I mean, uh, they don't have someone on site that regularly keeps an eye on what's going on with the building. Yeah. And I mean, it's a sad thing to say, but a lot of churches build these big buildings now today and they don't have a plan on what the future is going to be because, you know, you go through a $7 million, $8 million project, there's a lot of mechanicals and stuff in there that need to be taken care of on a regular basis or it's going to end up costing you a lot of money. And so, I mean, the future needs to be, you need to pay more attention to what's going on inside your facility. Danny, when you see these, um, the, uh, the um, yeah, the grates where the air comes out from the air conditioning. Clean them. Um, huh? Clean them. Yeah, I was going to say, when, when you see that they have like a, a blackish kind of uh, re re uh, residue, is that an indication that you're not keeping your filters clean enough? Absolutely. Okay. It means your duct work, your supply. Well, see, there's two different ducts. So, yeah, the return and the supply. Return and the supply. So yeah. your return's naturally going to get dust if you don't keep right. your floors clean, right? right? So that tells you I better start vacuuming. And the other one is telling you that yes, after your filter, there's there's supply dirt coming out of there. Sometimes. Um, if you just remove the supply, you can actually look up inside and see how far the dirt is. Sometimes just from normal use without the thing being used, there might just be dust two feet in mm -hmm. and not all the way up and back mm -hmm. to the unit. Mm -hmm. I just had like a stupid question, Jenny, but I'm curious to know, are, are you laundering those microfiber towels, or are you just throwing them away? We launder them. Okay, so you're using them over and over and over again. Yes. Okay. Uh, Denny, I wanted to ask, um, I know we have churches that have in, perhaps in the sanctuary or maybe in another public space like the offices or the, or the uh, fellowship hall have probably radiant heat radiators um and no air conditioning right um what are um other other than you know knocking holes in the wall and and having vents to bring air in what are what are the options for spaces like that well like i said if you have an if you have a uh, exhaust fan it's the best thing to use and nine times out of ten your old churches aren't tight so if you draw a negative with an exhaust fan, you're going to pull in fresh air from every crack. I mean, it's just a given. That's what's going to happen. And you can feel the difference. I mean, when we, now this is totally opposite, but when we first put those fresh air intake uh, ductwork in the church, as soon as I walked in the church, I could tell the difference in the air quality. It was amazing. And um, I mean, the rest of the building, other areas, 
I had the same situation in the preschool because we removed all the asbestos from there and now it's a clean building, but we don't have air AC over there or the, avail the ability to bring in fresh air. But I have that 36 inch exhaust fan. And when I turn that thing on, this whole building is like one big giant vacuum cleaner. It just sucks it right through. Mm -hmm. Going and, back to what Bob just said a minute ago, some some churches, I think what Bob was saying, and I, Little Zion is the same way, we might have a hot water circulation system. Yep. Some of that is baseboard radiant. Some right. of those hot water systems go into a forced air fan driven exactly. uh, heat system that has a switch that you could turn on or off right would you recommend churches with those type of systems to leave them off this winter so trinity in 97 i talked touched on this earlier they used to have radiant heat in their entire sanctuary mm -hmm. so rather than replace it because they found out <laughs> that 50 years is the maximum life because the, the piping that they used did not mesh with the concrete so after 50 years, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have a leak. Yeah. So that's known in the in industry. So one of the options is no, when Trinity right. was torn apart, they could have came in with a tubing and laid that all across the floor and laid a two inch concrete slab and replaced the radiant heat rather than doing that because i don't even know if they looked at the cost i wasn't here but i'm sure they probably the engineers looked at the cost and for cost cutting reasons they had old units in the attic air conditioners on both sides okay so that's 30 feet in the air <clears throat> they added exactly what you're talking about they ran copper pipe put a coil on the other side in each unit. So now in the, in the winter when we're calling for heat, hot water goes through those coils, those uh, fans turn on and we're blowing hot air down from 30 feet in the air. And we're also doing that with the two other big units, the package units, what I talked about, we're doing the same thing. They put hot water coils in there. So, <clears throat> a lot of money and I mean it's common knowledge in the industry that if you want to heat people you have to heat them where they're most vulnerable and that's at their feet yeah. if your feet are cold your whole body's cold doesn't matter that's so if you're great. sitting there and you got your feet nice you're sitting in a pew and you have your feet flat on the floor and that radiant heat's coming up it's the difference between keeping a room 68 or 75. Yeah. You know, with forced air blown down from 30 feet in the air, you got to keep that room 74, 75 to, to be able to keep a 70 year old person warm. If I have radiant heat, I can put that at sometimes 65 to 68 and have an elderly person still feel comfortable because that warmth of the of the floor coming through is just a totally different heat. So there here lies the other problem, which is back to where we started in the beginning. The CDC is worried about us all because of the winter, because we're gonna dry everything out and make that stuff stay airborne for a longer period of time because of the forced air. I'm, I'm, I have radiant heat baseboard heat in my house and I love it and I, I will never change it. I, my, my friend of mine has two houses, one in the shore and one in North Carolina and they're both forced air. And every time I sleep there, I wake up the next day all clogged up because I'm not used to it. And my body hates it. My allergies just say, get me out of here. And so we're, we're blowing all that stuff around, right? And, and that- Is it a, a solution to have a humidifier of some sort? Yes. Room? Yeah, you could put a, an April air in your system. And then, so that sprays here again. Now, now we're spraying humidity into the ductwork, okay? So here's where your UV light will help you out from growing mold inside. 
I'm thinking too of the churches that don't really have that kind of system. Right. You know, with just having a, you know, a household humidifier or a couple of them. Right. Mm hmm Yes. Okay. Well, like I said, the CDC's recommended 40 to 60 is what they want you to keep 60% is what they want you to keep your humidity at in your building. So, and that's to make the so-called droplets heavy so that they fall to the floor. Danny, thinking back to the early days of Legionella, which yep. was an, another airborne uh, disease or condition that, uh, that killed a lot of people. Do you find many air conditioning systems that are still water cooled? Chiller system. Yeah. They're still out there. Um, but a lot of them are doing what I've talked about. They're, they're not only using UV lighting in some parts of the system, but they're also using chemical in the water in a chiller system. So back in the 70s, there was a lot of things different that from then to, the, to, to compared to today. Um, one of the things I talked about and touched on was when the, the indoor fan turns on to bring your return air through the filter and through the coil. Years ago, once your room was satisfied, everything shut off. It just stopped. The outdoor condenser shut off. The indoor fan shut off at the same time. The coil remained wet. Nowadays, most units the outdoor compressor shuts off. The indoor fan stays on for a time period so that coil is able to dry so you don't grow mold on the coil. So I think that was one of the things that they also looked at from the Legionnaires to the disease whole issue. I was a young guy back then, it was in the 70s. And so I remember it because I, I used to watch the news with my dad all the time. And I remember the whole issue about it. And I found it quite interesting, to be honest with you. Um, it, it, so yeah, I was quite fascinated with the whole thing. Uh, related <laughs> to that, I remember seeing, I don't know if it was from the CDC or just from a professional group, but there was concern about the water systems in buildings that have been, right. that have been sitting. What, how how right. have you handled that? Right, well, this one doesn't sit. I'm here every day. I flush it. <clears throat> so, and it's just like my, <clears throat> excuse me, my parsonage is empty right now because we're going through the call process. I'm over there every day. I flush the toilets. I run the water in the sinks because I keep the traps full. So, like I said, some of these churches, they build these huge buildings, you know, which is great. It's a wonderful thing. Everybody loves growth, but you have to have a plan. And so somebody has to make sure, even if it's a volunteer or a paid person, that somebody's responsible for what's going on. Uh, we're here every day, and we have been since the shutdown. Um, be quite honest with you, it's been awesome. We've gotten a lot of work done, and it's you know mainly because of the 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 fact that I have a really good congregation who supports the church and all of us who work here and. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say enough for that. Okay, so you're, you're in a situation where you've been on top of that all along. What about for us, uh, for those of us that have uh, a building that's basically been shut down and not used uh, with regard to the water supply and so forth? Uh, any recommendations for us as to as those who are getting ready to start back up and stuff? Yeah, run it. Get in just, there and just run, run it. it. Just, just flush it. Just flush it. Yeah, get okay. in there and run it. Danny, yeah. you're also blessed with, a, like you said, an extremely good congregation and so forth, but you got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. And one that I think you probably already have done this is what kind of legacy are you going to leave for the future? Are you, do you have a procedures manual? You're laughing. You don't have to laugh. What kind of procedures? You must be thinking of this already. What kind uh, of ma manual are you putting together? And would you recommend for all other churches? Like under these extreme conditions we're dealing with, here's the things we've learned, and here's the things I want to pass on to the future, like flushing your system and so forth and so on. I realize technology in AC and heating can change, 
but certain things are common sense that every church probably should put together and say, here's what I'm going to pass on to the next guy. You just said the brightest bulb in the room, common sense. It's common sense. It's common sense. Think about it. It's common. It's all common sense. You know, when I was a young kid learning, I, I would learn something and I'd sit back and think, well, why should I be so fascinated? When you think about it and you take it apart, it's common sense. When you really I think, think one of the things it. about COVID is that it's teaching us to do things that we should have been doing all along. Yeah. That's why true. weren't we? That's true. It's a, and you know, I touched on the fact about back in 1956 when this building was built, these people knew this, you know that, because they went through 1918, half of them. So they knew the importance of fresh air. So years later, somebody came here and said, you don't need that fan in the, in the steeple. Well, they used to have this big giant vent that was up in the balcony and when that fan turned on in the, the steeple, you could crack the windows in the sanctuary two inches and all that air just flowed through the church. So they were well aware of the importance of airflow when they built the building. And so, you know, we come up with all this air conditioning and all these fancy tools and everything. And here, these guys, they knew it all along. So maybe it's time just to look back and, and say, what's the simple things we can do to try and improve the air quality without spending a ton of money? Hmm. You know? Do you would recommend it? Be help, that if, yeah. Would it be helpful if we created, if Denny and I created a list of things that you should be doing in a building, uh, in a vacant building at this point? Um, that would be really helpful. Yes. Yeah. 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 Excellent. So one of the most important things right now is we're coming up on the heating season. Mm -hmm. So a lot of your systems were sitting there dormant and with nobody in there, I mean, it would really be important to get in there and run that heat and make sure you don't have problems because I, I, I know what it's like. I run mine in the middle of the summer sometimes here. I go in and manipulate it and make it run. So I have an inspection next week. So. I'm getting things ready down there now. We'll put a list together and then we'll, we'll get that to you, Bob. That would be great. Thank you. I'll share it with Thank you. this Thank group you. and the whole Senate. I mean, I don't but, know what kind of situation all of you have, but like here I have kitchen inspections because we have a licensed kitchen. I have elevator inspections because we have a licensed elevator. I have boiler inspections because of our vessels are that size that need to be inspected. I have five of them with our heaters and our makeup tanks and stuff like that. So we have regular inspections we have to keep up with. So I don't know how a lot of you have any situations like that, but that's why it's important to have someone, either it be um, a volunteer or someone paid that really knows what's going on with your building because it can save you a ton of money. Thank you for coming on, Denny. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. And so if anybody needs anything or if there's anything I can help you with, it's dsmith at trinitylandsdale.com. Well, that's really excellent. Thank you, um, yes. Denny and Lisa, for helping us out. Could you show us that um, printout you had from Granger again, just to see the title? It's HVA Strategies to Control Airborne Pathogens. Okay. Got it. I want to make sure I have the right one. I put the link to that in the in the chat. There's several in there. Granger is a really good it's, company, by yeah, the way. Um, they're very informational. I mean, some of their products are a little expensive, but it's usually pretty good quality stuff. And um, their information link is, is really, really good. And I, I would definitely suggest you print this out, read it, highlight what you really sticks out to you, and, and have a conversation with your AC guy. Mm -hmm. And if he tells you it's a bunch of crap, then I would hang up. 
Yeah. Plain and simple. Because, I mean, we're all taught to be good stewards, right? But I think the most important thing is to be good stewards of each other. Amen. Well, thank so, you. And I, I really appreciate um, that insight that we're focused on COVID right now. Um, but as you say, CO2 is an issue for yep. people. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. Are an there's all kinds of things you can solve by doing just a couple things in here. In those older buildings that don't have um, those kind of systems, do you think there's any value to the um, the air purifiers that um, you know the, the some the people room ones? I, I, and I think there's an article in here about that. It might say say about don't use them. Um, you know, simple thing like a fan blowing out in a window, <laughs> blowing out, pulling air out through the building it, it will help. Mm -hmm. You know, just getting that air moving. Right. Will help. Um, some of those systems like you're talking about, you can spend a lot of money on, or you can, you know, go out to Walmart and buy one for $150 or something. But I, I, I think that they don't recommend that because of the fact that it's not, the volume isn't there. Okay. It, it can't really do a lot. It's okay for rev residential but not really for a commercial building. I had seen that, recommendations um, to use them in schools, and I guess a classroom might be the size of a large living room, but sanctuary certainly is not. Um, well, not you know, schools school. are a tough thing. We have a school here, and when we get back in, I mean, I have things figured out, I think, but schools are always a tough thing because the little guys carry things around and you really don't know, you know? So that's why a couple of years ago, we started with the simple spray bottle method and we were spraying high, let everything drop. Same thing as with the, this, but, and then we come back and wipe down because, and it seemed to work. It did seem to work because, you know, you'd have, you'd have 30 kids in there and everybody seemed healthy. Then all of a sudden, two weeks later, you've got five of them out with a stomach virus. Yep. So, you know, it, it, it's tough to tell. One day they're fine, the next day, boom. And so schools are tough. Well, I thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, are there any other questions folks have for, for Denny? Like I said, if anything comes up, just shoot me an email. I'm here every day. So I usually try to get my email first thing in the morning before I get wrapped up and, and I try to do what I can to answer them. Danny, if, if our, our um, guy that does the air and heat is one of our members, yeah. and so if he has questions, can he contact you directly and just you two can kind of Oh, absolutely. Yep. All right. Yep. You have my email. He can, he can email me. Okay. Thank you. Well, this has been really informative and I've already had a few requests to show the video to, um, congregational teams. So we'll definitely yeah. make that available. Oh, good. I'm I, anything I can do. I mean, I was kind of surprised that I got asked, but I, I'm, I'm more than willing to help anybody. So. If, if you get one thing out of today, then I did something right. Well, I'm pretty sure everybody got one. A lot. More than one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and good. I just want to thank you. I know, um, you know, we've, we've worked with you on a number of Synod events that mm -hmm. Trinity has been the host for. And, and mm -hmm. the facility and the work that you do is really impressive. So mm -hmm. we well, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah, Denny, I tried to give John Waltz a quick call, but I didn't I didn't connect with him. I was going to try to get him to join us. So he'll have to watch the uh, the, the recording. He's a good man. Yeah, a good man. We miss him. So we did go to 1211, um, but certainly um, if you've got other things on your mind, um, Let's take a few minutes and 
talk them through. I have a question that's unrelated to this at all, but it, <laughs> it, has, it has to do with returning to the building and um, talking about using pre-filled communion cups and whatnot. And my question is, we have padded pews. So when we start using these things and people pick them up and then we have the communion, how are people who are using them handling the residual trash that they create immediately following the communion? Because when you drink that thing, there has to be a drop of juice or two still in it. And I can't see that doing anything but staining the upholstery in the pews. So we were just talking about that because we were, we have a situation where we were possibly thinking of doing something in the church. Like I said, we're going through a call situation. So what do you do with those? Cause we use those, we've used them for outdoor service. And so Lisa and I were just in the sanctuary yesterday and we were discussing how do we pick them up? Cause you need to pick them up right away. So do you have, cause we're looking at, our pews, we would block off every other pew, right? And then like we did outside, we put up four and two. So we did four chairs, two chairs, four chairs, two chairs, because most families are either four or it's a couple of two, right? So we were thinking of setting up the sanctuary that way. So then how do you pick up those cups without everybody touching something? So you I put a usher down one side and an usher down the other side, right? And the basket, they put the cups in, you're only dealing with one family on this side and one family on that side as you go down the row. So we were trying to come up with a solution. Would that work? So that they're putting it right into a basket, the usher's wearing gloves, the usher goes right in the back and dumps it in a trash can in a plastic bag. Because you don't want them sitting there with the cup. Because like you said, it's going to end up on the floor or on the pew or all over the place. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I was trying to avoid having, having ushers getting that close to the people. That, exactly. You know, but, you know, what else can you do besides, then I was trying to think is, is Have there you ever seen how the Catholics do their, their collection with the long pole on the back? <laughs> mm -hmm. I was thinking the same thing. Is it possible to put something on the back of the pew? You, so, could also, you could also give them a paper bag and one per, per pew and have them, when they leave the church, have all the collected vessels in that one bag and right. drop them, let them self-dispose it in the back of the church. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to cr not create a lot of unnecessary more trash. You know, that was... But if you, if you have every other pew empty, the pew in front of those is theoretically empty. So I was looking to see if there was something I could put on the back of the pew that hung on there that they could put the waste in there. And then we come along later and pick it up. Like a cup holder or something. You know, like, yeah, something. Yeah, leave, a, leave it back in the back of the that pew. That would clip onto the back of the, the yeah, pew. Yeah, like super sized, super sized uh, <laughs> Coke cup or something hanging yeah. on there. Yeah. Just Make a thought, everybody's jumping in looking to what can you collect them in. Communion usually comes very close to the end of the service. Yeah. And you have that little foil uh, piece that you peel off to get at the elements. Yeah. If you place that little foil cover into the cup, it doesn't leak. And I think most adults are responsible enough that they can set it at their feet or hang on to it until the end of service. We have a, a, a receptacle for everybody to uh, throw their cups in when they leave. Um, but I'm just thinking, I, I think sometimes we're overthinking it and I think, you know, most people are adult enough to be able to be responsible. Yeah, well, we, are, we actually thought about asking everybody to bring a Ziploc bag. Mm -hmm. Put it in a Ziploc, zip it yep. shut, put it in your pocket, throw it out yep. when you leave. Yep. Yeah, That's I, actually I, how we hand ours out. Ours are um, packed in one, two, and three in Ziploc bags. Yeah, that's how ours are on the porch because we're letting people come pick them up. Yeah. yeah. So that's an idea, I mean. And then just return it to the, the trash to the bag, you're saying. Yeah. yeah. 
I don't actually, when I open the, the receptacle, I don't, I, I don't peel that aluminum foil all the way off. I peel it back and fold it, take the communion, and then pull it back over with a little tab and pinch it back on. I mean, it doesn't seal it, but it does yeah. keep it out of my pocket. <laughs> That's what I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, you know, after, after the communion, and then you have, you know, you have the, 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 fi the final uh, uh, lit liturgy, and then you have an, an ending hymn. I can't see anybody standing or holding that thing for five or seven minutes. You know, it's going to end up on the floor, or it's going to end up on the pew. I just see them ending up on the pew, and because if the pews were wood, you could wipe them all down, but ours are upholstered, the base yeah. feeding, yeah. and it just, I mean, that's going to be a, a nightmare, you know, just is concerned how people are doing it. Though. I take how it many people, not how many people, church, how many are open? Are any of you open? You're actually, we're you're outside, open. but we're open, but we're yeah. outside right now. So I was at uh, St. Marie Garetti two weeks ago for a um, graduation for St. Stan's for my grandson. Uh, and it was interesting. They had all the pews blocked off. They had separation. And then they did communion. And he stood up there and he touched every wafer with his hand. Hmm. So they did everything, but then he went and touched every wafer. And then after it was over, everybody gathered out in the lobby, elbow to elbow. <laughs> so it was I, I just didn't understand that it was like you did everything right until that point it was it was, it was kind of strange except a lot of us when it comes time for communion we do wash our hands before we serve so if this person had done that yeah. Then their hands are yeah. clean. You're not touching anybody else because you're not you're not touching anybody as you give them the wafer. Right. He did have sanitizer, and before he started, he did sanitize before he started. Yeah. So I was paying attention to everything they were doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The bad part of it is fine. The the gathering afterwards, not so much. Yeah. It was it was really quite strange. So. Mm. Well, I would think in that case, you'd also have to be careful not to really touch hands as you're giving the weight. Exactly. Right. You're still, you're still going to be within six feet of every communicant, and you're going from one to another to another to another. Right. Yeah. Right. That's right. And they're unmasked at that point. And yeah, and see, with them saying that they don't know how long this, let's call it emissions, from your body stays in the air, we had a situation where they wanted to do something in the sanctuary where people would just continually walk through 25 at a time. Well, you're going to be moving into the person in front of you space like every couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's actually worse than having service. So if I was going to do that, why wouldn't I just have church service? Yeah. You know, because they're saying if it's airborne, you don't want to be constantly moving into another person's space throughout the whole building, you know? The way we've gotten around things on that is as people come in, they pick up their bulletin, they pick up their little element cup. Um, we're not touching anything, they're not touching anything other than what they pick up, they come in, they are at their place when we do communion. We do not have anyone come up anymore mm. either continuous communion or kneeling. We don't do either one of those. Everybody remains at their seat right. after I consecrate. Then uh, when, oh, excuse me, uh, then I have everyone uh, open their cup, the wafer, body given for you, open the cup, the, uh, the blood shed for you, they consume it. And then they're responsible to hang on to that. And then at the end of the service, they put it in the trash can that we have there for them. So you that's... Know, Lutherans can learn new ways to do that. <laughs> What's that? I didn't hear you, Bob. I said, what do you know? Lutherans can learn new ways to do things. <laughs> oh, we're getting flexible. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're becoming Presbyterian. So we're done. 
<laughs> well, we're we are you know we're we're either a, we have to be adaptive because that's that's our only choice. Yeah. So, Denny, when you said people are picking up uh, communion elements, does that mean they're using them at home or using them as part of a Eucharistic online ministry. service? It's the Eucharistic ministers are picking them up on the porch and then oh, taking. Okay. Yeah. So they're visiting shut-ins or other yeah. other folks as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just started. Nice. I always pick up an extra one that I can bring home for my mom and then she watches the service and then she, she has it. Yep. Hey, well, thank you all for your time and attention, especially Denny, thank you for again, yes. sharing so much with us. This is a great, great resource. And we will be together next Thursday, for those of you who are um, clergy, there is also a um, gathering to talk about worship during the pandemic and communion that is coming up next Wednesday. Yes, next Wednesday at 2 p.m. And you should have seen some email about that. And um, you can... Uh, let your treasurers know there's a call tonight at seven with our treasurer, Janet Neff, if they haven't already signed up. Um, that link has gone out to your um, church offices and pastors. So be happy to have anybody join us. We're just, uh, you know, the more conversation, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's excellent. Um, Pastor Hansen, would you be willing to pray us onto the road? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to join together and the blessing of having Dennis with us to share his insights as we all struggle to find new ways to tell the old story of your love to our people. Be with us, guide us, and bless us in our various ministries that we may faithfully serve your people and be your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, have a blessed day, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Bob, as always.